Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Reference Point. I'm your host, Dave Cokerhook. And this evening, we're going to be discussing the second segment of two regarding immigration reform here in the United States. And again, joining me this evening is Kelly McCown. Did I do that right this time? You did. I did, good. And, um, and Kelly, thanks for sticking around and doing another segment here at Reference Point. Appreciate that. My pleasure. So last time we were talking about some of the fundamentals and basics about what goes on with the immigration laws as they are and some of the challenges and things like that. And actually between shows something was uh, brought up that uh, I think is worth taking about a couple minutes mm -hmm. on. And that is really touching on that, that there are quite a variety of visas that are available for people to, uh, to utilize to be able to come to the States. So can we, you know, we talked about a couple of them. We talked about the H-1B, we talked about the agriculture one, which is sort of a dog's breakfast. And, <laughs> uh, but there's a bunch of other things too. So can yes, you just kind of give are. a real quick overview of what some of that possibility sure, are? Sure, sure. So all of these visas that I'll start with letters are temporary visas to come to the United States for different purposes. So um, maybe the most temporary would be a visitor visa. So there's B1 for business visitors. So these are people generally who work abroad, have a job abroad, and are coming for a conference or for a meeting. Uh, okay. Um, sometimes to, to talk with colleagues who work for the same company in the United States for a subsidiary company. Um, w would that be like a, if there's a, a, a major conference of some type here in the States and someone's coming from Europe or Asia or whatever to attend mm -hmm. that conference, that would be that type of visa? Yes, okay. that would be the perfect visa for that. Okay. And typically they're not paid in the United States, they're not working here during that time, they remain on their foreign payroll or at, with their foreign employer and they're coming just for generally a short visit. And then the B2 is the tourist version of that, that's mm -hmm. people coming to visit, to go to Disneyland, to uh, visit family, and, and they can stay, generally they, they might stay for a longer period of time, up to six months even. Mm. Um, and that's seen as pretty normal. Uh, people from certain countries that are considered visa waiver countries can use those two categories without actually applying for a visa in their passport. Mm. They just show their passport at the uh, airport, they have to register it, their, you know, some basic details online first through a system called ESTA. Mm -hmm. And then once they do that, they can travel to the United States and be admitted for up to 90 days right. without even going to a consulate to get the visa. Oh, cool. And then there are student visas that allow people to study here. Um, F1 is the most common. Mm -hmm. um, people also come on J1 visas and sometimes M1 visas to study. Uh, but the F1 is, is a nice one because at the end of the program, the student gets pr a, a year of practical training optional practical training and that allows the person to um, get work experience and really learn about the field of study oh. and hopefully be prepared to get a job offer that would lead to a, a, a true work visa after that's over. Well that would, yeah that's reasonable. Good. And we talked about the H-1B which is the yes. most common visa for people working in specialty occupations. Those right. are jobs that require a bachelor's degree or higher and there's a visa called an L-1 for multinational transferees. Oh, and somebody, so that, that, like a company like General Electric that has facilities all over mm -hmm. the world and they're maybe coming from some other part of the world to work here, is that? Exactly. Okay. So if they've worked for at least a year for General Electric abroad, they can transfer to the U.S. Uh, related entity and work here under an L-1 visa. Got it. Um, and then there are, there are so, other so types are there, of are work visas, visas as well. visas that start with letters? No. <laughs> they all start with a letter. <laughs> Makes it easy. That's good. Well. Thank you. That that actually adds a little bit more perspective to the, to what we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, and I think that now what I, I want to start digging more into some of the the issues that are pertaining to uh, the value proposition of reform. Mm -hmm. um, I had mentioned in the last segment that uh, you were in a conversation we had. You were good enough to give me a uh, a website. What did I say? American Immigration Council's website, uh, immigrationpolicy.org, which was really very interesting. And I would recommend to the folks who are watching to uh, you know, maybe go up there and check it out a little bit because I think the average American has very little perspective on what's going on with this. If you're in some place like you know, Arizona and you're on a border town in Arizona or Texas, you're probably faced with things that we're not faced with in Seattle, Washington mm -hmm. or Denver, Colorado mm -hmm. or, or wherever. And um, and some of the everybody knowses are like 
way wrong. For instance, I think most people think that uh, the, the vast majority of undocumented uh, immigrants are from Mexico, and that may or may not be true. Um, in, in, the vast, in the whole thing about all immigrants are coming here anyway, whether they're legal or not, are coming from Mexico is really a fallacy. I think that's true. And, you know, maybe because we're in California and there, there are maybe is a higher percentage of Latino immigrants here, yeah. people tend to make those assumptions. But I think it's closer to um, something like a third or, or a fourth of all immigrants are from Mexico. Um, and the, the other third is coming from Asia and the other, is, other third is coming from South America, Central America and other countries. Right. So it's, it's really fairly balanced. And I guess the other, the other thing that I think is surprising or, or surprised me when I read it was that um, of the Latinos in the United States, about 60 percent are U.S. born, are native born. Oh, really? Oh, right. So Right. Of course. Well, California used to be belong to Mexico before we took it away <laughs> in, a, in a war there <laughs> some years, years ago. So that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And another one of these things that people talk about is, oh, a drain on the economy, a drain mm -hmm. on public services and things like that. But that's, mm -hmm. that's nowhere near true either, is it? I don't think it is. I, on the public services, it's clear that people aren't able to get any types of public benefits. So these are like cash benefits, means-tested benefits, like welfare, food stamps, things mm -hmm. like that. They're not eligible to get those if they're undocumented at all. And even once someone gets their green card, mm -hmm. they're not eligible for the first five years. Oh. So it's really quite a long time before people are able to qualify for those types of benefits. Um, and most of, you know, when you apply for a green card in most categories, you do have to show that you're not going to become a public charge as right. part of the process that you um, either have a job offer or your family member can support you at at least 125 percent of the poverty level mm. so that there's supposed to be a guarantee in the system that people don't need to to take advantage of benefits like that. Right. It seems that um, the press sometimes, and, and, and it can happen on either the left or the right, mm -hmm. will take a, an example that might be a very narrow example. I mean, you look at just about anything. You look at any kind of business endeavor, for instance. I do a lot mm -hmm. of work with small and medium-sized companies all over the U.S. And you look at any, any industry group, and there's going to be a very small percentage of individuals that try to game the system or that try to work outside the rules mm -hmm. for whatever that discipline happens to be, whether it's construction or pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. or manufacturing. It doesn't matter. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so you are going to have a few individuals here or there who mm -hmm. are looking to game the system when it comes to immigration. But I think the challenge is, is that we blow that out of proportion and mm -hmm. try to paint everyone with the same brush. Mm -hmm. No, I think you've got a good point there. I mean, I think it, it becomes an issue in my line of practice in H-1B visa work that employers are um, kind of painted with a broad fraud brush, meaning right. that there's a lot of, a lot of focus on, on fraud in the system, in the H-1B system, let's say, in the sponsorship of these workers. And um, I think the incidence of fraud is actually much lower than maybe the media would would lead you to believe. Right. Um, you know, there it's a it's a very complex system to sponsor somebody for some of these different types of visas, and employers, you know, often are trying to do the, the right thing on their own. Well, if they don't but and they get caught, then they they're, they're in the trouble, right? Exactly. So. Exactly. There was another interesting thing uh, from the American Immigration Council. They, they asked this Q and A section up there. Um, the idea that people who have entered the country unlawfully don't pay taxes and, and that sort of thing. But apparently, three, uh, th this was interesting. I'll just read this. Three state-level studies have found that unauthorized immigrants pay more in taxes than they use in benefits. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. these were studies in Iowa, Oregon, and Texas. And, of course, if they're working in some way, shape, or form and they're on a W-2, then they're going to... That's know, right. And, and they're going to pay... If they own a piece of property, they're going to pay property taxes. If they have, uh, uh, if they live in a state that has a sales tax, whatever they buy, the mm -hmm. sales tax is going to be there. So, so there again, I think that some of these things are mm -hmm. um, 
uh, blown out of proportion. And is that mm -hmm. what's going on in Congress right now? I mean, these, they're, they're talking about these issues, especially in the House. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate passed a bill, bipartisan thing. Maybe it's not perfect, but it, it brings us f closer toward a more balanced approach, it seems to me, if I'm understanding mm -hmm. it correctly. And I can't, I haven't read it all, but I've read mm -hmm. about it. But in the House, they're just beating each other up for their different little, you know, oh, you know, way left or way right, right. kind of perspectives. And <laughs> how do you break that kind of a deadlock? Maybe that's what I'm going to ask my viewers <laughs> to try to help out with here. Well, I think we need a solution. I mean, it's it, it's clear from from polls that the majority of Americans want this problem to be rectified, that they want to see immigration reform that works and um, recognize that that we need a path to citizenship for people so that they can actually get into the legal system, register, um, be part of it. You know, that, that helps with enforcement. Also, it helps with our security to have everybody in, in a system as opposed to just being here and not being registered with the government because right. there's no system for them to register with. Um, but I think that is, um, is a key part of it, and I think people support that. So I'm not sure what will happen in the House. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that clear heads will prevail and there will be, you know, pressure for the, um, you know, primarily Republican leaders there to um, find something they can support in right. this immigration reform bill. Um, but I think what you said about immigration and the economy is a really important part, a really important aspect for us right now because we've been through, you know, five years now of, of challenging economic times just oh, in the, sure. you know, in the, in the near past. And um, if we could pass an immigration reform bill in the first 10 years, it would add something like 80, 800 billion dollars to the GDP. Wow! And this, on the, on the other side, to actually pay money to physically remove people, these 11 million people from the country, would be something like 2.6 trillion dollars. Yeah, it would cost in more cost. To, to try to extract them than it would to. Prov yeah. You know, you raised an interesting point because I'm going back to something that from the uh, referral you gave me mm -hmm. to the American Immigration Council that talked about the impacts on the economy. And they, they, they specifically had done surveys in 10 states that indicated that between 2006 to 2010, there was something like over 1 million entrepreneurial businesses that were started mm -hmm. by immigrants here mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. And in 2010 alone, the net um, revenue generated by those businesses was over fifty-four billion dollars. I mean, that's an awful. That's, that's, that's an amazing. That's, that's number. a lot of money, mm -hmm. and and it's not just that this one guy is doing something over here or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of cases, if these people are starting a business, they're going to hire one or more people. You know, yes. I mean, fifty-four billion dollars would put a few people to work. Right, and I think when you think about those businesses, what sometimes comes to mind is, you know, a family open a, opening a bakery on the corner or a dry right. cleaning shop, but the, the other types of businesses that maybe don't come to mind so readily are the tech entrepreneurs sure. starting a company that could hire and employ 100 people over the next few years. Right. So they're, they're companies that really could be the next Google, the next Intel, if given True. the opportunity, True. and I'm contacted constantly by um, very smart entrepreneurs, some of whom went to Stanford and got PhDs, and now can't find a way to get a work visa because they own the majority of shares in their company. Uh -huh. And it's very, very difficult right now to get any type of visa if you are the controlling shareholder. And really? so it really makes it difficult for these folks in the early stages, especially before they've diluted their ownership and brought in outside investors. It's, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for them. And um, so they really struggle with it. And I think it's, it's a real barrier to our economic future to not, um, you know, some people joke, put a green card on their forehead when they get their master's or their PhD. And, you know, that's cavalier. But, I mean, really, these are people who have gone to school here and really want to contribute and they want to stay in the states and they want right. this to be their future and we're not really allowing that to happen with our system. Right. I want to take that a step further because I think that when you talk about some of the uh, um, 
people who are here that are getting that kind of education mm -hmm. and, are, and are spinning off uh, possible mm -hmm. businesses, that's a, that's a huge part of the economy. But the other side of the economy fits right in with these people that start the dry cleaners on the corner mm -hmm. and the service station up the street because as we move forward as a country and as we find our population and the boomer mm -hmm. generation that's aging more, these kinds of services that people are going to look to have done. Who's going to fix my car? Mm -hmm. Who's going to come and clean the gutters? Who's going to mm -hmm. do this? Who's going to do that? Those service level mm -hmm. things are, st are very necessary for us. And um, I, I did a show a couple years ago with some uh, folks that own their own auto repair businesses. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that the average age of an individual who, um, who does that kind of physical work uh, for them to retire is like, 48 years old because your body gets real beat up and eventually mm -hmm. you can't do that so much anymore. And at the average age of the the folks here in the Bay Area anyway who mm -hmm. were still doing that kind of work was at that time like 42. Mm. So you reach a point of uh, who, who are you going to mm. find to do that? Right, right. So, so And those are important, I mean they're very important jobs in our economy. Yeah. And um, I mean they, th when you think about people coming and, and starting these kinds of businesses, it, it sh it's really like, it, it really is the American dream. People want to work hard, they want to contribute, they want to be part of something, right. and they want to they create something of their own, you know, for themselves and also for their, their families in the future. And I think it's, it's kind of what America's always been based on, is, is immigrants coming and sure. doing these kinds of things in our country. Sure. Yeah, it, so I think that from what we've talked about here. Uh, my guess is that, and, and it, you mentioned it earlier, that the average American citizen or the majority of Americans are in favor of some type mm -hmm. of, of, of reform structure that puts a little bit more balance in. I don't really understand why there's the logjam in, in Congress to be able to uh, move forward on this. I mean, is, is it just... Uh, uh, I don't want to ask this question. I know that, that uh, Arizona, for instance, had done some things to mm -hmm. try to put some laws in place that were because they were having some perceived problems there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're a, country, they're a state that borders uh, uh, Mexico. Um, but then those laws were struck down by, by uh, the Supreme Court, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So I can see where there might be certain locations where there's a bit of a... Uh, uh, localized issue, mm -hmm. but they're trying to nationalize mm -hmm. the the um, a, a way of dealing with a localized issue. Am I yeah. s perceiving that correctly? I think one of the issues is that the the senators and representatives who are from states with higher levels of immigration and maybe higher levels of of, uh, of undocumented population are facing a lot more pressure to deal with the issue and to and they also have a, a lot of voters in their districts who are pushing them to do something about this issue. And I think there are others in other states who maybe don't have that pressure from internally, from within their own constituencies, mm. and are, are being more resistant to actually do something about this hmm. and to reach agreement with their colleagues on this. So I think that's an interesting part of it is that it's, um, even though it's a national issue, it has a, such localized impact depending on where you are in the United States. Even though every state has immigrants, sure. there's such a different situation in the border states, you know, in the, in the southern part of the country compared with the north or compared with the Midwest. Right. So what's the solution? We just need Congress <laughs> to, we need them to work with each other and get something done, make, reach some agreement because this is a, you know, this is an opportunity. And I think, um, you know, I think that, um, We've, we've wasted this opportunity already once five years ago when we, there was an you know, immigration reform proposal that went a long way and then didn't make it. Tell me about that. I mean, I don't, actually don't remember the circumstances about that. That's, you're saying five years ago, so this would have been just In 2006, we um, had an immigration debate that went, you know, went on for quite a while longer than this one has so far. But it's really, you know, it, it, there, were, there were too many differences and they couldn't be ironed out. And I think, I think this time I would hope that, you know, our, our economic issues over the past few years would 
help us focus that focus on the need for this right now. Mm -hmm. That these are um, these are people whose work talents and other talents are not being used to their full potential. Um, although you mentioned people are paying taxes, I think having some sort of a legalization program or whatever you'd oh, like to would call it huge. would add huge amounts of money to our tax Agreed, uh, yeah. our tax revenues yeah. and you know not just income tax but property tax people want to buy homes they want to open bank accounts they want yeah. to um, you know they may be in jobs that are withholding taxes from their income or they they may be in jobs where they're just completely paid cash, uh, under, paid the cash under the table right. there's no um, there's no tax withholding right. there so does so, so, that actually raises an interesting question because there uh, um, certain businesses might find that structure more favorable for mm -hmm. them because then they don't have to report certain things and, and you know so but that also lends itself to the opportunity of um, oh taking advantage of uh, mm -hmm. those people who are in that situation most definitely it seems like the rational thing to do is to find a way for that, whatever that number is, was it 11 million or something mm -hmm. like that, the number I've heard? Mm -hmm. Individuals who are here and have been here for a while. And you were saying something earlier though, I think that some of these people have been here for a very long time. It's not like they came across the border yesterday. Well, that's true. Um, I mean, the, think about the, um the young people who are I mean, the dreamers, so-called dreamers, who are were brought here as young children. Most of them are, you know, have been here 13, 14, 15 years, right? Wow. Because they're that's about how old you know they're they're in their late teens, um, which means their parents brought them here at that time. Right. And that so they've been getting a lot of news. Million, right? right. So so many of these people have been here for a very long time. Wow. And they've been part of the community. They're um, they're living with us. Their kids are in school in the same school our kids attend, and um, in many cases, they may be um, they may be kind of in the closet about their undocumented status. I've I've seen that that happen actually, where especially with younger people, I think they've just never told their friends about their situation. Yeah. Wow. And um, because they were raised mostly here, especially these, these Dream Act kids um, or young people, they, they think of themselves as Americans. Sure. They, you know, they've lived here their entire lives in most cases. And they came very, as very young children. So is there anything in place for these people right now? You were telling me, I think, at one point that there really isn't an existing mechanism for someone who is in that situation to be able to to get to a point where they right. can get a green card or something. Right, right. That's right, David. I think um, quite often people ask, well, what, you know, why can't these people just get their situation taken care of? Why don't they just register? Why don't they file the paperwork they need to to get legalized? And there really isn't any way for them to do that if they entered without inspection mm. because to obtain a green card to obtain a legal visa they'd have to depart and go back to wherever their home country is mm -hmm. and in most cases they would trigger a 10-year bar to any type of benefit uh. and so it would be very difficult for them to take that risk and most people wouldn't be willing to do it so even the people who are married to u.s citizens have to go abroad to apply for a discretionary waiver and that was only recently changed just in the last year um, the government created a process where they can apply for this waiver before they leave the U.S. So at mm -hmm. least they would know, hopefully they'll know whether the likelihood of, of ultimately mm -hmm. rejoining their family is right. good. Right. Um, but, um, you know, that was another part of our system that, that went away um, in 2001. The, it used to be that you could pay a thousand dollar penalty if you were in that situation and still be able to get your status legalized, get oh. a green card. So if you married a U.S. citizen, even though you came across the border without inspection, you could pay this penalty and, and still get your, your status. And then that law expired. <laughs> and then when it, it, when it sunset, it's never been reinstated. Ah. So it's, um, you know, that's no longer an option for people. That sounds, that sounds like a revenue opportunity for, for the government to be able to <laughs> reduce the, uh, the deficit. Right. <laughs> you could probably make it $10,000 and people would still be yeah. willing to pay it. 
but it's it's um, it is a little bit of a catch-22 because people want to get into legal status and they may have an employer that wants to sponsor them for a green card or uh, a visa or a spouse who they could apply through other family member and mm -hmm. yet they they can't do it without leaving can't. and right. taking that huge risk that they won't be able to get back so or I think we are and we're just about at the end of this segment so we're gonna have to wrap up here but it seems to me from everything that we've talked about in both our, our segments here that um, the the, the issue is a substantive issue for us as a country. We need to deal with it. It has uh, economic benefits. It has social benefits. Mm -hmm. It has emotional benefits mm -hmm. uh, to, to resolve this thing. And based on everything that we've talked about, it seems that of this 11 million people, virtually all of them are um, people that, w that we should embrace their presence here. Mm -hmm. You know, Maybe there's a mm -hmm. few here or there that maybe not. But They'll figure that out as you go along. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think the point is, um, think about this and, and, and let your representative know that you want to see them move in the direction of positive reform for immigration because this is something that's going to impact all of us as time goes on. So, Kelly, thanks again for coming and visiting us here at Reference welcome, Point. This Dave. has been really uh in, incredible information, very valuable, I think, and I hope the audience uh, responds to us here and, and takes some action. Great. So, appreciate your being here, and you folks out there watching us, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Reference Point.